Hello, welcome everyone. This online charter series webinar hosted by the Center for Constitutional Studies at the University of Alberta. I'm Alina Ritzma, the Center's Public Legal Education Coordinator, and I'll be your moderator for today. Um, before we get started, um, the Center would like to acknowledge the tragedy of the recent finding of an additional 751 unmarked graves at the site of a former residential school in Saskatchewan. And so we'd like to start off um, by taking a minute of silence. Thank you, everyone. Um, and now I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land that we're on. Um, as this is a webinar, many of you uh, may be watching from across Canada. You might even be in different parts of the world. Um, so I'd encourage you to reflect upon the land wherever you're at um, as I acknowledge the land here. Um, the Center for Constitutional Studies is located at the University of Alberta in Edmonton on Treaty 6 territory. And the center acknowledges and honors the ancestors, traditions, and the spirit that first drew Indigenous peoples here the Cree, Blackfoot, Metis, Dakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Soto, Inuit, and then settlers to this gathering place. In acknowledging the territory we're on, we're also, we also recognize the past and ongoing acts of settlement and colonization that take place on this territory. The center, the university, and the city enjoy the benefits of treaty, and the center is committed to the spirit and intent of treaty to maintain us in a stronger and lasting relationship. The center recognizes that land acknowledgements um, are only a very small step in recognizing and upholding Treaty 6. So before I introduce our speaker for today, um, I'd like to just go through a few housekeeping details. Uh, first, you'll note that the chat function has been disabled. Um, and to ask questions, you can use the Q&A button on, on the bottom of your screen. You'll be able to see one another's questions. And if there's a question that you like, you can click on the little thumbs up next to it to upvote it. So it'll be bumped up on our list. Um, and if you wish to remain anonymous, there's an option for doing that when you ask your question. Um, after I finish my introductions, um, our professor Anna Lund will speak for about 25 to 30 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions afterwards. And we may not be able to get through everyone's questions, depending how many there are, but we'll get through as many as we can before we run out of time. Also, please note you'll receive a short feedback form after the presentation. You'll see a pop up on your screen. And if you could um, go through that, we'd really appreciate it. Um, your feedback is extremely valuable to us. And last, please note the webinar is being recorded and we'll have it available in a day or so. So this webinar is part of our online charter series, um, a series that's intended to provide some information about specific charter sections. And in today's webinar, we have Professor Anna Lund uh, discussing section 12 of the charter, the right to not be subjected to cruel and unusual treatment or punishment. Um, and in particular, it's sorry, applicability to corporations um, and in the context of the session, I believe she's also going to be touching on um, ideas of personhood, um, as well as bankruptcy. Um, so before I turn things over to her, I'll give a very brief introduction. She specifically asked me to keep it very brief. Um, so out of respect to her, I'm keeping it short. Um, Anna Lund is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Law. Um, and her book, Trustees at Work, Financial Pressures, Emotional Labor, 
and Canadian Bankruptcy Law was published in December 2019 by the University of British Columbia Press. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Anna. Thank you. Um, thank you for that nice introduction. I, I think that all of us are probably um, thinking about the news of the, of the 751 graves that were uh, announced this morning. Um, and, and I know that I'm gonna be taking some time today uh, to grieve those children, uh, their families and their communities. And, and then thinking about um, how to commit ourselves to address the, the ongoing injustices of colonialism uh, that permeate so many different areas of law, including uh, some of what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. Um, today, I, I wanted to start with a story. And uh, my story is about Jonathan Freeman. And my story starts on October 2nd, 2012, when Jonathan Freeman was pulled over by the California Car Patrol. At the time, he was driving in a high occupancy vehicle lane. Now, for those of you who haven't had the great pleasure of driving on California highways, uh, high occupancy vehicle lanes are intended to encourage carpooling. And so they reserve some lanes on the highway for vehicles that have over a minimum number of uh, passengers. This lane required vehicles to have, and this was how the law was written, two or more persons. Now, Jonathan Freeman was the only human in his vehicle. However, he argued that he was not the only person in his vehicle. Because he had the incorporating documents for his nonprofit company, Jomi Joe Foundation, next to him on the car seat. Officer Dorn, who had pulled Freeman over, uh, wasn't prepared to accept Freeman's interpretation of the two-person requirement, and he issued him a $478 ticket. Freeman challenged this ticket in court. The matter was heard by somebody called a traffic referee. And the referee upheld the ticket. He noted that Freeman's interpretation didn't align with the common sense interpretation of the two person requirement. And he underlined the fact that the uh, rule had been set up to encourage carpooling. The court did not say anything particularly controversial about corporations and whether or not they have legal personhood. Now this I imagine was quite disappointing to Mr. Freeman. Um, he was a uh, self-styled uh, corporate rights activist opposed to the idea of corporate rights, I should underline. And in one account I heard of this story, it said that he had been driving around for 10 years with these incorporating documents in the car with him, hoping that he would get pulled over so that he could make this argument. Why are these cases about corporate personhood loaded? I think there's a couple of different answers. And one is because of the way that personhood gets mobilized in other contentious discussions, discussions around abortion, animal rights, and environmental rights. And so the way that we construe personhood vis-a-vis -vis corporations may have implications in these other discussions. But there's something also uncomfortable that a lot of people find uncomfortable around the extent to which corporations are given legal recognition and other entities are not. And so I have a quote here from a uh, American legal case where a number of environmentalists were trying to have the Colorado River recognized as having legal personhood. And they said, uh, the Colorado River is 60 to 70 million years old and has enabled, sustained, and allowed for human life for as long as human life has been extant in the Western United States. Yet the Colorado uh, has no rights or standing whatsoever to defend itself and ensure its existence. Well, a corporation that can be perfected in 15 minutes with a credit card can own property, issue stock, open a bank account, sue or defend litigation, form and bind contracts, and on and on. I'm gonna jump aside for a moment and say, we just had a uh, talk at the Center for Constitutional Studies about the legal personhood of Rivers. Um, Jason Unger and Yeni Vega Cardenas discussed recent developments with respect to the Nagpai River. So if the legal personhood of Rivers is of interest, I'd encourage you to go watch the recording of that. But back to the personhood of corporations. So I think a second reason that 
these questions around the personhood of corporations are contentious is because there's a perception, maybe also a reality, that corporations are using the concept of personhood to avoid accountability for their wrongful acts. And that brings me to the case that I'm going to be focusing on today, which is the Supreme Court of Canada's 2020 decision in the Attorney General of Quebec versus 9147 uh, Quebec Inc, a numbered company. This was a case about whether or not corporations can claim protection from cruel and unusual punishment under Section 12 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And you might be asking yourself, how does a case like this get to court? So what happened was there was a company carrying out uh, construction, building construction in Quebec. They were required to have a license. They had not um, got that license and they were charged with an offense under provincial law. The provincial law provided a minimum fine, uh, about 10 grand for natural people, that's flesh and blood people, and about 30 grand for corporations. The company challenged the fine and argued that it violated uh, section 12 of the charter. Now, there are two different ways that corporations can raise charter arguments. They can say, um, this law applies to both flesh and blood people and corporations, and it's unconstitutional as it applies to those flesh and blood humans. Or they can say um, corporations are entitled to charter rights and this violates the corporation's charter rights. I'm going to start with an example of the former. Um, some of you might be familiar with the Big M Drug Mart case. This is a decision of the Supreme Court of Canada from 1985. And it was a company uh, that challenged the federal Lord's Day Act. The Lord's Day Act prohibited both uh, humans, flesh and blood humans, and artificial humans, corporations, from selling goods on Sunday. Uh, Big M Drug Mart sold goods on Sunday, was charged under the act, and it challenged the law on the basis that it violated the guarantee of freedom of religion in Section 2 of the Constitution. The court found that the law was un unconstitutional because it applied to natural people, flesh and blood people, and it violated their freedom of religion. The court did not need to decide whether or not corporations have a religion, whether or not that is protected under the charter because the law was unconstitutional. And the court said, no one, that includes flesh and blood people, that includes corporations, no one can be convicted of an offense under an unconstitutional law. Okay, the Quebec Court of Appeal determined that this kind of argument wasn't available to the numbered company in attorney general and numbered company. Why? Because there were different laws for the natural people and for the corporations. So the minimum fine applicable to corporations did not apply to natural people. Uh, corporations couldn't challenge it on the basis that it was unconstitutional as applied to natural people. So that means that they have to uh, make out the second kind of argument that corporations can claim charter rights. There's a two part step that corporations need to establish if they're going to show that they are entitled to charter protection. First, they have to show that the corporation falls into the defined class of rights holders. And second, the corporations can actually exercise the right. So what does that mean falls into the defined class of rights holders? You look at the language of the charter. Each section contemplates a different group of people. So section two, uh, that's freedom of religion, freedom of expression applies to everyone. Section three, uh, right to vote that applies to every citizen. Section seven, we're back to everyone. Everyone is a broad enough term to potentially include corporations. Every citizen in section three can't include corporations. Canadian courts have decided that corporations are not citizens. So if we take a look at section 12, the language used there is everyone. Corporations have made it over the first hurdle they potentially could claim uh, Section 12 protection if they can establish 
that uh, the protection in Section 12 can actually be applied to corporations. Can corporations actually be subject to cruel and unusual punishment? If so, then they can claim that they need protection from it. The Quebec Court of Appeal. So before this gets up to the Supreme Court of Canada, there's a Court of Appeal decision from Quebec and the majority of the Court of Appeal says that yes, Section 12 does apply in substance to corporations. They can be subject to cruel and unusual punishment. And there are two main thrusts to how they reach this conclusion. First, they noted that cruel and unusual punishment had traditionally referred to um, corporal punishment and execution. But then they noticed that our ideas of punishment have changed over time. And constitutional protections must evolve along with them because of the um, conception of our charter as a living tree. Fines are much more common now, and courts have recognized that the extreme economic harm caused by a minimum fine can amount to cruel and unusual punishment when the harm is gross grossly disproportionate. The second main thrust of their reasons was they looked at the people who would be impacted by this fine uh, levied against the company. And so they said driving a company into insolvency causes serious harm to the people behind the company and also the broader community. You can think about the company's employees who might lose their jobs, uh, retired employees who might lose benefits, uh, governments are gonna lose tax revenue, other companies uh, may uh, suffer. Imagine that you're a supplier to a big company and that company uh, goes through insolvency proceedings or winds down, uh, you're gonna suffer. And we've also seen that big, com big companies that are um, vital to a region's uh, economy really impact that region when they go into insolvency proceedings. So we've seen that in Northern Quebec with mining companies. We've seen that in the forestry dependent communities in British Columbia. And we can imagine what the insolvency of a big oil and gas producer might do in a place like Fort McMurray. So the Quebec Court of Appeal majority says, yes, section 12 applies to corporations, but there's a dissenting judge. And the dissenting judge had two reasons for finding that uh, section 12 cannot apply to corporations, that corporations cannot claim protection under section 12. First, uh, they said that section 12 is inextricably licked, linked to the uh, concept of human dignity. Um, flesh and blood humans can experience dignity. He said, you know, animals might have dignity. Um, when that dignity is denied, there is a type of suffering that we want to protect people from. Um, the judge went on to say corporations don't suffer in that way. Uh, he had this beautiful line about how corporations don't have a soul nor an emotional life, so they don't experience suffering. And that it trivializes the suffering of humans to suggest that corporations do. The second reason that the dissenting judge gave was that uh, we need to respect the separate corporate personality. Okay, so in Canadian law, Canadian corporate law, fundamental principle is that a corporation is a separate person from the people involved in the corporation. If you set up a corporation and it incurs debts, those debts belong to the corporation. You are not gonna be forced to pay them absent some sort of contractual guarantee. The court said, if you're gonna take advantage of the separate legal personality of the corporation when it benefits you, you also have to take uh, the drawbacks of that separate legal personality, which means um, we're just going to look at the impact on the company. We're not going to look at the impact on the people behind the company. Okay. This decision then goes up to the Supreme Court of Canada and all nine justices agree, no, Section 12 does not apply to corporations. Um, they accept this link between Section 12 and human dignity. Um, they reject that corporations can experience human dignity and therefore they cannot be subject to cruel and unusual punishment. And uh, they reiterate the importance of separate corporate personality and say we're not going to look behind the company at the people who are suffering. Now, in some ways for me, 
uh, this was a disappointing decision. Not because I didn't agree with the outcome. I, I think they reached the right outcome, but they didn't talk about what I wanted them to talk about. I was really looking for an extended discussion on legal personhood and how that applies to corporations. Um, they did have a debate. It wasn't about that. Uh, there was a 5-3-1 split and what they were um, not a, reaching agreement on was what use the court should make of foreign and international materials when it's interpreting the charter. Um, so the majority uh, in reasons authored by Brown and Rowe saw a more restrictive use for these materials in concurring reasons um, authored by Abella. Abella argued that uh, because the charter is an evolving document that needs to evolve alongside society, we should use these sorts of materials more generously. And then we had uh, concurring reasons from the newest justice, uh, Kayser saying, we don't need to decide um, about how to use these materials because we all agree that section 12 doesn't apply here. Uh, and I know that this was basically his first year on the bench still when, uh, when this decision was released and maybe he just wasn't quite ready to, um, to pick a side in this fight. Okay, so what? Well, we don't get much in terms of direction, read really the concept of legal personhood. And I find myself feeling a little bit like Jonathan Freeman um, he, of course, spent 10 years driving around with incorporating documents in the car with him and uh, finally got to court only to not have the issue engaged with. I didn't wait quite that long, but I really was hoping for more direction on corporate personhood. There are some important implications to this decision, though. Uh, Jennifer Quaid, who is a colleague of mine at the University of Ottawa, wrote a piece in the conversation, which I would encourage you to read. And she said there were three main takeaways. And I think that these are three good takeaways from the case. First, um, the Supreme Court of Canada reinforced that separate corporate personality is a fundamental concept in Canadian corporate law, um, except of course, when we make exceptions, but one of these, uh, this isn't a case where we're gonna make one of those exceptions. Second, uh, she said, corporations can't challenge regulatory fines on the basis of Section 12. So she writes, we avoid injecting unnecessary uncertainty in the, to the prosecution of corporations for regulatory offenses. Okay, we've taken that defense off the table. Third, um, she said, courts can impose fines on corporations uh, even when the fines create the risk of insolvency. And she pointed to an earlier decision of the Ontario Court of Appeal um, against Metron. That was a criminal prosecution of a company after four workers died on a construction site. Uh, the company pled guilty to, uh, to offenses under the criminal code, but then there was a fight over what was the appropriate sentence. And the Ontario Court of Appeal in that decision said, um, you can impose a fine even if there's no evidence that the company can actually pay it, even if it creates a risk of bankruptcy. Sometimes bankruptcy is going to be the right result. Um, they said you can take some, uh, it's one factor to consider. The, the ability of the company to pay is one factor, but it is not a determinative factor when you are setting a fine. Okay. So with the rest of my time, I want to spend a little bit, um, a little bit of space thinking about economic harm, insolvency, and the charter. So in, in the attorney general and numbered company case, uh, Abella in her concurring reasons writes, um, recognizing the suffering of individuals from harsh economic treatment by the state does not lead to the inference that Section 12 protects the economic interests of corporations, okay? And, and what you see in the Attorney General case is that the, the company that has been fined is trying to build on an earlier decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in uh, the Queen and Boudreaux. In the Queen and Boudreaux, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada held that a fine imposed on an individual, so a flesh and blood person, could violate 
Section 12 of the Charter. But this wasn't an ordinary fine. It was a mandatory victim surcharge imposed um, under the Criminal Code or the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. And it was being imposed against a specific population. So the Queen and Boudreaux, we have a number of lower level decisions that are all heard together by the Supreme Court of Canada in one big, um, in one big hearing. And the Supreme Court of Canada described uh, the representative offender, sort of the, the thing that tied all these people together, as someone who lives in serious poverty, has precarious housing, struggles with addiction, may have a disability or be Indigenous. And the court found that section uh, 12 was violated here because of four different types of harms that the mandatory minimum uh, surcharge created. The first was disproportionate financial consequences. So this surcharge uh, was calculated per offense as opposed to um, being varied with respect to the individual's income or being varied according to their moral culpability. Uh, and the Supreme Court of Canada thought that resulted in disproportionate financial consequences. There was also the threat of being put in prison. If you didn't pay the fine, you could be locked up. You could also be locked up pending a hearing about whether or not you were able to pay the fine. And the court noted that this, um, this detention pending hearing was more likely to be used uh, with street homeless individuals and seriously addicted individuals. Why? Because they tend to have more previous missed court appearances on their records. Uh, the fine was delegated to provinces to collect and there was evidence that these collection measures sometimes caused serious impacts. There's evidence that in British Columbia that one of the ways that these fines could be collected was by withholding or making deductions from somebody's um, social insurance, social insurance payments, their welfare payments. And finally, uh, the court found that these fines created a de facto indefinite sentence. Why? Because the individuals involved had no ability to pay them off. Um, they were repeatedly being drug into court to explain why they weren't paying their fines. The court compared that to a form of public shaming exercise and they couldn't get a uh, suspension of their record until they had paid off their fines. So what's important here? Well, I think a key takeaway from the Queen and Boudreaux is that when we're talking about Section 12 and we're talking about economic harm, we're not just talking about a big liability, a liability that's so big that you can't pay, but the liability has to be creating some sort of additional harms. And I think that this is a really important point to make because there have been a number of arguments raised at the Supreme Court of Canada around bankruptcy and the charter. So the case I talked about today, um, should a company be protected from bankruptcy by section 12? The Supreme Court of Canada said no. Uh, in Irwin Toy, we have a company saying, um, forcing us into bankruptcy violates section seven, life, liberty, and security of the person. The court there said, no, uh, section seven doesn't apply to you companies. In Beals and Saldana, which is a case about an enforcement of a judgment from Florida, that judgment was being enforced against flesh and blood people. And they said, if you enforce this judgment, it's so big that it's gonna drive us into bankruptcy, that would violate our section 12 uh, right to life, liberty, and security of the person. And the court said, no, um, bankruptcy is, is different from, um, from the types of interests that Section 7 protects. Okay, I, I wanna pause for a moment here and, and, and do something that I do at the start of my, my bankruptcy class at the university. And let's talk about the difference between insolvency and bankruptcy. Um, this will be uh, familiar to a lot of you, but I, I think it's an important point to keep in mind as we're reading these cases. Insolvency is a factual state. Insolvency refers to having more liabilities than assets. Whereas bankruptcy is a legal process and it's, it's one of a number of different legal processes that are available to flesh and blood people and corporations when they are insolvent, when they can't pay their debts. And, and I think this is important 
because of how the arguments around insolvency and bankruptcy are being used in these charter cases. Um, now, bankruptcy means different things if you're a corporation or if you're a flesh and blood person. When you're a corporation, if you go into bankruptcy, that usually means that the corporation is going to get liquidated and that the corporate entity is not going to continue on. So you see in some of these charter arguments, the company is saying that bankruptcy for a company is akin to death. And there's, I mean, that's probably an overstatement, but, but there's, there's some validity to that argument. Of course, though, corporations can be liquidated in lots of other ways, including through legislation like the company's Creditors Arrangement Act. And a lot of corporations stop operating without any sort of formal proceeding. So really the issue here is imposing a liability that's so big that the company can't keep operating. And as the court said in Metreon, as the Supreme Court of Canada said in the Attorney General, sometimes that fine is going to be warranted. For individuals though, bankruptcy is actually um, quite a, it can be quite a positive move. Uh, it provides individuals with a financial fresh start. Why? Because when individuals make an assignment into bankruptcy, when they start bankruptcy proceedings, they're gonna have most of their debts released in exchange for giving up their property. Okay, that's the big benefit of bankruptcy is, is you get a discharge in it. And, this discharge of debts, this releasing individuals from debts, is animated by a similar concern to what the Supreme Court of Canada is talking about in the Queen and Boudreaux. They're saying that um, individuals shouldn't have to languish hopelessly in debt forever, okay? The de facto indefinite sentence in Boudreaux, that was a concern. In bankruptcy, how do we take care of people? We let them get out of their debts by going through the bankruptcy process. Of course, even in bankruptcy, you don't get out, out of all of your debts. So section 178 of the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act sets out a number of different categories of debts that you can't discharge in bankruptcy, that you can't release in bankruptcy, that you're still gonna have to pay once you're done your bankruptcy process. And in that list um, is any fine penalty uh, or restitution order imposed by a court in respect of an offense uh, or any debt arising out of recognizance or bail, okay? I wasn't able to find any case law where a victim surcharge under the criminal code was characterized as this kind of debt, but I'm pretty confident that it would be. So again, that points to the specialness of the debt in Boudreaux, uh, the way that it was different from just a regular financial liability. And so, What's the point of all this? Well, I, I think that for at least flesh and blood individuals, when we're talking about um, economic harm and economic harm is potentially rising to the level of charter violation, the availability of bankruptcy proceedings should be um, viewed as part of that picture as one route that may be available for individuals to, uh, to avoid indefinite indebtedness. Now, of course, it wouldn't have been available to the uh, individuals in Boudreaux because of Section 178. There's also a question about whether really impoverished people are able to access bankruptcy at all because they have to pay for the cost of bankruptcy. Um, and there's some good scholarship by uh, Stephanie Benishai and Saul Schwartz on, on how we could make the bankruptcy system more accessible for that population. Okay. So at the end of the day, the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in the Attorney General and Numbered Company really doesn't provide us with much insight into what it means when we say that a corporation is a person. Um, but it did get me thinking about debt and when imposing debts on individuals, flesh and blood individuals might run afoul of the charter. And I hope that I've managed to convince you that this is an interesting topic because I do expect that we are gonna see more charter litigation around section 12 as applied to individuals in the context of economic harm. And with that, I will um, turn things over for questions. Thank you so much, Anna, for that excellent and uh, very clear presentation. 
Um, so for attendees, if you'd like to ask questions, um, could you please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen? Um, you'll be able to enter questions there and you can even ask anonymously if you'd prefer. Um, you can also sort of upvote other people's questions if you like them by hitting the little thumbs up button that you'll see by questions. So we're open to questions. Let's see if we have any yet. I don't see any questions at this point. So I don't know, perhaps you can get... Oh, I don't see one here. There we go. Uh, they're just coming in. All right, so two questions. Um, first, you think that the dispute over the use of international and comparative law may have burnt up the capital to discuss legal personhood. So let's maybe start with that one and then we'll get to the second. Um, it's an interesting question and, uh, you know, I, um, I come to this as somebody who teaches corporate law, as somebody who researches bankruptcy law, um, who's maybe less familiar with the, with the personalities on the, um, on the Supreme Court of Canada than, than even Gerard, who's asking this question. Uh, Gerard's a colleague of mine at Robson Hall at the University of Manitoba. Um, but, but I think it's, it's a possibility that they, they got into this other fight and then there just wasn't time to get into legal personhood. I think that legal personhood is also um, a, difficult, a difficult topic to litigate maybe because um, so many of the questions go beyond, uh, go beyond statutes, go beyond legal principles to really questions of metaphysics. Um, I was... Uh, I was surprised when I read the Quebec Court of Appeals decision because the legal reasoning there, um, I think there was uh, mention of Foucault, uh, which as, a, as an academic, you, you hear Foucault thrown around a lot, but you don't see him a lot in the, um, the Alberta Court's decisions. Uh, and talking about the case with colleagues, somebody said that that, that may reflect sort of a, a different thread in legal training in Quebec as opposed to the common law jurisdictions. Um, so, so maybe it was a matter of capital, but I think it might also be a matter of, of just the difficulty of having a, a conversation that is uh, grounded in law doctrinally the way that, um, that our courts try to, to have these conversations that also engages seriously with the question of, of legal personhood. All right, so the second question um, was, do you think it would be prudent to have a cut and dry rule that corporations do not have charter rights at all? Justice Abella in Quebec Inc. seemed to be critical of the cases that held that corporations have sections 2B and 8 rights. Would it be simpler to have a rule that the reasons animating the charter simply don't apply to corporations? I'm not sure I buy this, um, partially due to concerns about personhood that may extend to non-businesses, but also because I find it hard to make sense of Section 11 if it can't apply to corporations, but I'm curious on your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it definitely would make things um, simpler uh, because now there is this uh, question, I mean, not now, this is a question that has, that has plagued the, um, the Charter basically since the time it was adopted about which sections apply to corporations and which sections don't. And, you know, I, I see arguments on both sides. Um, Howie Kislewicz at the University of Calgary has written a piece about um, arguing essentially that Section 2 Religious of Freedom maybe should apply to corporations. And, uh, and I think he makes some convincing arguments there about the benefits that accrue in terms of um, protection of religious minorities, protection of religious diversity. Um, and, and I can see how, how charter protection is useful in, uh, in other uh, situations, including around freedom of expression. Um, so I, I'm not sure that I, <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm ready to throw all of the charter protections for corporations out but I'm also open to being convinced that maybe that would be a good thing because of the way that um, the corporations have used the charter really quite strategically to avoid uh, regulatory action. And I think, um, though I don't, I don't have empirical evidence to point to, I think that the problem in Canada uh, tends to be more 
uh, under persecution of, or under prosecution, I should say, of corporations for regulatory offenses as, as opposed to the opposite. But, um, but that, that again is maybe an empirical question. So thank you for the questions, Gerard, those are great. All right, so we have another question. Any idea about company bankruptcy rate in Alberta compared to Canada? I haven't looked at those numbers recently. Um, and uh, the coverage that I've seen has been more around um, individual bankruptcy rates, which are sort of lower than everybody's been expecting. And, and people keep thinking that there's gonna be some big spike in them. Uh, but those are statistics that are publicly available through the Office of the Superintendent of Bankruptcy. They do a really nice job of, of producing those semi-regularly. So if that's, if that's of interest, I would, I'd refer you to that website to see the most recent and up-to-date ones. All right, so next question I think is quite a, a big one. Um, recognizing that the concept of legal personhood hasn't been fully adjudicated in the courts, what role um, should policy objectives or what role do policy objectives play in the discussion? And how do you think the policy objective of encouraging new business and small medium enterprise factor into the conversation? Yeah. Um, I mean, is it, is it um, inconsistent to uh, find businesses that have run afoul of regulations and also try to encourage businesses. I mean, one answer is you're not gonna get fined as long as you're complying with regulations, right? Um, of course, the, the counterpoint to that is uh, um, we live in an incredibly complex legally regulated uh, space, right? And, and trying to make sure that you are complying with all of the regulations is difficult for um, for corporate lawyers to figure out and for individuals who are navigating that space without the benefit of a corporate lawyer um, even more so. Uh, I'd, I'd also note that there really has been a move to having fewer people in employed positions and more people running their own companies. And those are not big multinational companies. They're not even big 20 people companies. Those are one or two people companies um, where they're in charge of everything from ensuring regulatory compliance to making sure that they're paying their taxes and, um, and that's a lot and, and it can be difficult to navigate. So is there an inconsistency there? Maybe. Um, last time, so I, I gave a talk about uh, corporations and their charter uh, on the same day that the Supreme Court heard the attorney case uh, back in January of 2020. And I'd received a question then um, that I, I, I was worried I might get today. So I was doing some thinking around. Um, and the question was about, well, well, what happens if there's a mandatory minimum fine and um, and it is really big and it's too big? Like what, what's a company supposed to do then? And if they can't challenge it under section 12, are there other legal avenues open to them to challenge it? Maybe. Are there um, political avenues open to them to lobby the government to change the legislation? Maybe. But, but I think maybe the more straightforward answer is, is that a lot of our regulations, at least here in Alberta, are not set up with mandatory minimums. Like that, that seems to be a little bit um, a little bit unusual to me. I, I went and I looked at a few of the um, of the regulations that you often see corporations being uh, charged under things like the Environmental Protection and Enforcement Act and the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And those are all set out to include maximums, not minimums. And I think that that is maybe um, part of the answer for governments is to set the fine, say that, you know, a fine is owing, set the maximum, but then give courts discretion to, um, to contemplate, you know, things like the moral culpability, things like the ability of the company to pay. But that's just one consideration. It's not the only one. If the company's done something really bad, if they've had four of their um, workers die in a situation that amounted to criminal negligence, like maybe we do push them into bankruptcy. But if it is a um, small, you know, we throw around the term sort of mom and pop or a small 
and medium-sized enterprise. And they're really just trying to do, do the right thing and, and ran afoul of the regulations notwithstanding that. Then you give the court some leeway to vary that fine um, so that it's, it's smaller. Okay, so the next question um, is specific to the, the case, that Quebec case. Um, it says there were different fines for physical and corporate persons in that case. But given the decision, should we rethink the capacity of corporations to challenge mandatory minimum sentences that apply to both? Would the Section 52 remedy be to strike the minimum only for physical persons, making the debate moot? I, I think that the, um, the answer that flows from Big M Drug Mart is that if it's an unconstitutional law, it's an unconstitutional law, it's an unconstitutional law, and you can't apply it to corporations. Um, so that's, that's the doctrinal answer. Um, from a policy answer, I think it would always be open to the legislatures to go back and, and reinstate a minimum mandatory fine just for corporations. Um, would it also be open to a uh, court to rewrite the legislation to say, um, now it just applies to corporations? I guess it might be, I guess it might be. I mean, we've seen, um, we've seen instances of, of courts uh, exerting that kind of creativity um, in their charter remedies. So uh, I, I don't know a case of where that's happened, but, but it's an interesting idea. Okay, so the next question um, is perhaps we're drawing a line around corporate personhood and the charter from regulatory view, search and seizure and Jordan issue. Do you think the Supreme Court decision opens any arguments around these areas? Um, no, I, I don't like, it really just didn't say anything about the corporation, right? Um, it was it was sort of at most one or two paragraphs in um, uh, in the majority decision. Uh, Abella talks a lot about um, different uh, international and foreign um, resources where they've held that cruel and unusual punishment doesn't apply to corporations, but they really don't provide us um, much in terms of. Uh, of commentary about corporate personhood that's going to be of use in, in other charter um, other charter contexts. All right, so the next question here is, should the fact that the legislature has to pass a law to allow corporations to exist at all be a relevant consideration? This is to say, given that the corporation owes its existence to a law passed by the state, does it not follow that these fines as against corporations are part of the social compact that we need to take into or take account of in our constitutional analysis. Yeah, and I mean that um, that was really uh, the argument that the dissenting judge in the Quebec uh, in the Quebec Court of Appeal picked up on was that if you're going to take the benefit of this um, this state imposed uh, separate corporate personality, you you also have to take the drawbacks. Um, that go with that. I, I do think that, um, that it starts to get complicated when we note all the different ways that people organize themselves and um, sometimes go through some sort of incorporation procedure, either as, as a corporation or a cooperative or a society. And, and sometimes operate as a um, as an unincorporated entity, and you know how sophisticated are the people who are involved in that? Do they do they recognize that they are part of a corporation or not? Do they really understand the benefits that um, that flow from that incorporation? Uh, and and does it make sense to treat them differently just because they've gone through that 15 minute incorporation process with a credit card versus a similarly situated um, group of people who haven't? I, I think there's some really important questions there. Um, I, I recall that the Quebec Court of Appeal, that was part of their concern was that the um, 
and now I'm I'm drawing on my memory, so I could be misremembering this, but but I believe that the bigger fine may have also applied to unassociated groups or something like that. They had some kind of concern about the impact for unassociated groups, and they're saying like, of course, they'd be treated in the same way. Um, so I don't know, is, is corporations or incorporation sort of this magic thing that happens and then everything changes? Um, from a legal perspective, yes, but does that make sense given people's realities? I'm not sure and I could be convinced otherwise. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, so the next question is, there have been cases internationally giving natural objects a legal standing and they ask, can that be compared to corporations in section 12? Well, so, so the question of who else gets personhood is an interesting one, right? And I, I started off by talking about um, uh, some of the debates where it comes up, including animal rights and environmental protection. Um, there's also a case, I believe, from India where a religious icon was um, granted personhood. There are cases where ships have been treated as though they have legal personhood. And, you know, if, if we're, if we're taking this case uh, at, at what was said about personhood and section 12. Um, section 12 is all about dignity. Uh, and so is section 12 gonna protect these other things? We have to ask, do these other things experience dignity? Can they be deprived of that dignity in a way that causes suffering that we are concerned about? Um, the Quebec Court of Appeal dissenting judge said, animals might, right? And, and so maybe there is an argument that animals are entitled to section 12 protection. Um, ships, like that seems more difficult for me to imagine that ships have dignity and then experience suffering. Um, but, but if we're talking about other environmental entities, maybe there's more room for that kind of argument. Okay, so we have one last question here. Um, it said, could you see the lack of charter protection under section 12 used as a basis for potential future differential treatment for corporations and other areas of law of broader application? I'm thinking in particular of limitation periods, the justifications for which are arguably less applicable for corporations to rely on. Hmm. Okay, I'm not sure that I'm gonna be able to answer that one off the top of my head. When I think about limitation, periods. Um, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why we have limitation periods, but one of them is to facilitate the sale of companies. Um, and you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot uh, sell your company, or it's a lot more difficult to sell your company, or you're not going to get as much money for your company. If people with um, legal claims going back 20, 25 years could come out of the woodwork the day after the sale. Um, so I think that there are, I, I think there are still good justifications. Well, I think there are still justifications, whether or not we accept them as, as, um, as uh, sufficiently weighty to, to justify sort of what limitation periods do for people who have otherwise totally valid legal claims. Um, there are still justifications that apply to companies. And you know, section 12, it was, it was again all about human dignity. And I don't know that I have heard a dignity based argument for limitation periods. Um, if there is one, I, I hope that you'll email me because I would love to think through how dignity connects with limitation periods. Um, but but I, I, I don't see that. Um, oh. Anna, we lost you a little bit. Can you hear us? Oh, sorry, Anna. Do you mind repeating maybe the last part of your answer? We lost you for a moment there. Oh, sorry. Um, I was saying, I, I don't think that I have heard a dignity-based justification for limitation periods. Um, and that if there is one, I, I would like you to email me because I'd be really interested to hear it. Um, but because of that, and because of how important the idea of human dignity was to the, the brief um, consideration the Supreme Court of Canada gave to, uh, gave to Section 12 here, I, I don't see an analogy being made between those two areas of law. Thank you so much, Anna. So um, we managed to get through all the questions, which is wonderful. 
Um, so I'll just close off here by saying thank you so much, Anna, for that wonderful presentation and for answering all the questions um, with such thoughtful answers. We really appreciate um, you sharing your time and your experience and knowledge with us. Um, it's wonderful to have you with us this afternoon. Um, I'd also like to thank Zara Ahmed, who's our center's administrator, who's doing all the technical stuff in the background, um, as well as Patricia Paradis, the center's executive director, um, for all their assistance in preparing and advertising for the webinar. And I'd also, of course, like to thank everyone for um, who attended today. Um, we really appreciate your interest and your attendance and your um, enthusiastic and um, engaging questions. Um, our next online charter series will be in the fall, so keep an eye on our social media and keep an eye on our inbox, uh, sorry, your inbox if you receive our emails. You can also sign up for our mailing list on our website if you're not part of it already. Um, this webinar is recorded. It will be available probably in the next uh, day or so. Um, and just as a final reminder, um, when this ends, you'll see a link to a short feedback form, and we would appreciate so much if you wouldn't mind um, filling that out for us. It helps us sort of know um, things that we can improve, things that we're doing well, and, and even ideas. Um, you can give us ideas for future subjects you'd like to hear about. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, take care and be well, and have a lovely rest of, of the afternoon or evening or morning, um, depending where you're at. Take care, thank everyone. You.